Think Forward. Think Research Channel. There's a structural problem with genocide, which is that it tends to happen in places that are off the beaten path. So now, in order to promote nonviolence and reduce violence, ultimately we have to address the motivation. Society needs to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong challenge. The sit-ins challenge cherished beliefs, most whites held dearly. At the DNA level, we're all 99.9% .9 the same. All so individuals do matter, and I think the quality of our individual leadership matters. Who is speaking for poor people? 40 million Americans make $6 an hour. Who is speaking for them? The only thing that one has after throwing everything overboard is the love that one can give. An autobiography, in whatever form it takes, is a perilous enterprise. Uh, you can never quite tell what's going to happen to yourself in the course of it. You write things which may be misunderstood, and you may indeed say things which give the suggestion that you are proud, um, that you are... Uh, something other than what you really are. And uh, that's why originally I cast it in the form of a conversation between six people um, over lunch in Sausalito, California. This enabled me to uh, be contradicted and challenged by myself in such a way as to render myself seemingly, seemingly humble. <laughs> um, however, my readers didn't like that. They said it was much too, um, much too avant-garde. They wanted somebody who was deliberate, who knew what he wanted to say, and who said it. Uh, now, I was a little timid about doing that because I wanted to talk about gay rights. I wanted to talk about um, uh, faith and belief. And um, I wanted to talk about how I had abandoned belief in religion and uh, Jesus and all the things that in Virginia were highly respected I felt that God was something which was very important. That if you're going to talk about God, you're going to deal with God, you're dealing with something that is very important. If you're going to throw it away, you can still throw it away, you're still dealing with something that is very important. Because, by definition, God presumably is important. <laughs> That's what God is all about. Something that is Crucial, more important than anything else. This rather intimidated me um, in writing it, but I thought the best way to do, to do it, to get around it, and to show how I managed and how others managed to escape the tyranny of church life and religious belief, which I now regarded as tyranny, and I did not then and originally, um, was to just to tell how it happened, to go through my life in such a way that I could reveal from time to time uh, some of the crucial experiences which affected my change of belief. Um, journalists, professors, priests are all in the business of power. 
They want to persuade their audiences. Um, and I've been all three, so I know what it's like. And I think that, in a way, it's fraudulent. Because you know as much as I do about uh, existence. You exist. I exist. I don't exist more than you exist. So therefore, it's important to understand that this book is a sort of detective story which starts and in a certain place in the 1920s, um, takes us through the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s to the present. And in the course of it reveals certain flaws in religion which uh, I think are critical to understanding existence. I, I left the church and religion not because of gay rights. My problem was that I did not agree with the basic tenet of religion or Christianity, which was a belief in the supernatural. I did not accept the idea of the supernatural, something other than what is, something that other than what we see around us. That was my final conclusion. When I began in the 1920s, when I was raised in a, pi in a pious family relationship, um, uh, I lived through uh, World War II under the floorboards in the London Blitz and uh, prayed to God to save us from destruction. I went in the army, fell in love with the cook, and then went to Cambridge and fell in love with another young man, madly, violently in love, who seduced me into joining the church. He was a churchgoer, I became a churchgoer. I went to seminary, and I became a full-fledged Anglican priest. Very high church. I taught at school and then uh, eventually had a parish. And in the course of the parish, I met um, a, a very high Anglican clergyman who was my boss in the parish. And we had seven masses a week, sometimes two or three a day in which I begin to wonder whether we are not overdoing it. <laughs> now, uh, I remember the very first, first la very last mass I ever um, con um, celebrated in church, um, faced with the congregation, and I had by mistake placed the box of wafers on the clean white cloth which is established for consecration. And uh, at the end of the service, um, my colleague, my superior priest, insisted that I eat all the wafers in the box <coughs> because they had been consecrated. And I whispered to him, God knows that it's not needed. And he said, you must eat them. I said, no way. <laughs> there were four, four or five packets. He said, I will intincture them. So he got some wine, and this is the traditional high Anglican system. He, he, he took them out, and in front of all, the congregation was all waiting. He intinctured each one of these little bits of wine on each of, the, each of the wafers, and he was going to use these, he said, for sick visiting. So we put them away in a special part of the church where they could be taken care of by God and looked after until they were needed. Three or four days later, we went to 
picked them up and they had all gone moldy. So he ate them all and threw up in the vestry. <laughs> now this, I think, is a very, very sad story. This is a guy who is intelligent. Intelligent. What is he thinking? Not just about the church or religion, but what is he thinking about God? Is God like this? Does God, I mean, you know, but you see, it's very similar to what is happening, I think, amongst people in uh, praying to God in the midst of the hurricane, praying to God with the tsunami, wiping out thousands and thousands of people, and thinking that God will save them, rescue them. But he didn't, it doesn't, and yet they still go to church and thank God for not rescuing them, which is really rather like the people in the Titanic who was saved from the Titanic, who were thanked God for not being drowned. It doesn't make sense. Well, I carried all these things in my mind, and I thought about them again, constantly. And it became increasingly evident to me that there was more to all this than had been admitted by the church, that there were things, clearly where there were things which the church and which Christianity had never admitted to itself. I uh, left the priesthood, or at least I left being a priest, a parish priest in England because the BBC arrived. The BBC said they wanted me to join the uh, uh, religious department of the BBC to be a commentator on television and to do reports on, BB on, on religious activities in the United States. Would I go to New York? And I was offered a job in New York and um, a ticket was sent and so I went and left my, my parish and went to New York and had a parish in Greenwich Village, New York. And they said to me, you ought to go and explore America. And I said, yes, that would be very nice. I would love to do that. America was much richer, much more comfortable than Britain, which was very poor in, the, in 1958, 1959. So I go to Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> well, make you laugh. I go to Georgia. I didn't know, know where Georgia was originally, but I discovered it. I joined um, a com commune in Georgia called Koinonia Farm, which uh, was a, um, um, a community of African Americans and white people all living and working together. And I lived with them for a time, only to discover that periodically they were invaded by roaring trucks and rifles firing through the windows. It was the Ku Klux Klan. I had heard of the Ku Klux Klan. This was 1958, after all. I, mean, I thought they were 1920s, but no, not a bit of it. They were being organized by the local Baptist minister, who, whose henchman was the local sheriff. And when I arrived at the local Baptist church to face these monsters, they ran me out of town. Uh, they threatened me and with clubs and ran me out of town. Well now, you must remember that at this time, 1958, 1959, 60, everybody believed in God. Everybody was a Christian. They said they were, and of course, frequently they were not. But you wouldn't know it, they all went to church. And in America, there's a church on every corner. And so, the belief of one's heroes, all the people that you, one's teachers, the people, one, people that one admired, they all believed in God too. So it seemed to me it was impossible not to believe in God and to continue to be a Christian. I went 
feeling that I really wanted someone who was thinking about Christianity. And so I joined Jim Pike, Bishop Pike in San Francisco, the Episcopal Bishop. He had been, he had been uh, uh, attacking the Trinity and had been hauled before a consistory court uh, for heresy. Now, I talked to him. His son later committed suicide. He might have committed suicide. No one's quite sure. But he was a troubled fellow, especially about the Trinity. And I thought to myself, I don't think the Trinity matters, does it? Does it really matter? Must you believe in the Trinity or go to hell? Is that what it's all about? Is God, we're back to the uh, eating these wafers again. Well, he refused to discuss it with me, further than saying that he was fighting for his life against the conservative elements in the church. So, there we have San Francisco, me, a queer man, then called a pervert, of course, uh, and uh, faced with all kinds of problems to do with gay rights. I marched in, a, in, a, in one of the first marches in San Francisco, and I remember a mother standing or walking by me in the middle of the street. The streets were lined with jeering crowds and television cameras. And she was carrying a banner which said, on which she had written, my son is gay and I love him. I was wearing my clerical collar. And she came up and grabbed my arm and held it and we walked down the center of the street together with all the other people all shouting at us and things, rude things like go to hell, you will be in hell, you'll burn in hell, this kind of thing. And I thought what a brave woman she was. And in the middle of it, she lost her nerve and said to me, I, she thrust the sign into my hand and said, Please take it, please take it, because if my husband sees me, he'll beat me up. And I said, all right, but you, I'll be all right, you'll be with me. And she said, no, no, I can't bear it. And she rushed off into the crowd, and I carried, my son is gay, and I love him. <laughs> the BBC still wanted me to talk to people, so I interview all kinds of people. I interview, I go to Hollywood and interview all kinds of movie stars and celebrities. I interview Ronald Reagan. I asked him why he was against abortion. He said he knew nothing about abortion. He said he was just against immorality, which I thought was a weird response. <laughs> he and others were very interested in what was going on in the world and I talked to them all about various subjects, and I found that these subjects were nothing compared to the scientists that I was able to talk to. We talked about the brain, how the brain and the neurons get together. And this increasing understanding of the body and the brain, matching the increasing understanding that we have now about the climate and the surface of the planet where we live, and how important it is to preserve it, and how it, we're in danger of destroying it, and how we're in danger of destroying each other, and how we have ignored half the world. And we're on, this was only brought home to us with the suicides of the Islamic fundamentalists on 9-11. This for us was a shock. We hadn't known that people could actually believe these things so strongly they could die for them. So all this seemed to come full circle eventually. And I thought to myself, what is tying it all together is communications. 
And because I'd been engaged with BBC, I was invited by President Johnson's great society organizers to get involved in what, he, what was then called public broadcasting. And so they hauled me over to Washington and I became a founding chairman of National Public Radio. And we put it all together. And we tried to make sure that it was an agent for change. That's what we were talking about. Johnson was saying the same thing, very political, of course. But my, f my feeling was that it was very important to establish an, Im an improvement in communication throughout the country. We don't talk enough to each other. We have solved some of that with the internet. A lot of the, the stuff that we are learning, including sexual orientation, um, is now on the internet and is increasingly successful in persuading people that more and more gay people e do exist as they come out of the closet. And as they come out of the closet, they are proving that we are as good as anyone else and that we deserve time and money. This means that one of the big problems, the subtext of my search has in fact been, is being solved rapidly. And I have great hopes. We're now talking about uh, gay marriage, which we never thought of before, and gay adoption, and slowly but surely we will manage to become equal citizens with everyone else. The conclusion which I must talk about of the book is that scientifically we have reached a point in which we know, now understand more about our bodies, more about our brains, more about our planet than we ever realized before. And that this has changed us considerably because we suddenly see ourselves as, uh, as, or, as organisms, like all other organisms, living on the surface of the planet. And uh, you could say that it is indeed a new way of looking at existence, which does no longer need, no longer needs the supernatural. Now this is not atheism, it's not agnosticism. What it is, is materialism, scientific materialism, if you like, which I think um, explains everything on the planet. Let me read you from the last section of the book and also one of the sections from the new book. Our physicists tell us fixity is fantasy. Research into the nature of matter has revealed to us that it is entirely made up of simple energy, endlessly forming and reforming into a myriad variety of patterns. It's the same when we look inside our bodies and our brains. Everything is endlessly moving and nothing stays in exactly the same place. Nothing. At this, you might cry, it's nothing but a super soup. And indeed it is. And the final chapter in the book is called The Soup. It's a relative of the old primeval soup. The primeval soup from which life began, a much younger relative. The super soup is everything. Nothing has been lost. It still contains everything that it began with. 
and from which everything is evolving all the time, changing and evolving. It may go backwards, it may go forwards, depends on chance. But we can now measure it. We can now measure it. We couldn't measure it for thousands and thousands of years. We did not know anything about this until 1850 it began. 1850, 150 years ago. And up to then, the thousands of years before that, humanity was virtually, totally ignorant about what was going on. We now know the truth. Now, I know what you're saying. <laughs> he thinks he knows it all. I do. <laughs> if we wait long enough, we would see it all happen, come to fruition. We too change our, and, and, and play our part. It is a mighty force. Nothing can withstand it. Nothing is left behind. Nothing. But what of death? When we die, collapsed on the sidewalk, lying in a hospital bed, falling to our deaths in a brain crash, on the battlefield, at work or at home, we are already close to, surrounded by, enveloped, as it were, in immortality. Sheets formed from the cotton of the fields, or wool of the sheep. Plastics, oiled from minerals dug from the earth, or the oil of ancient vegetation. Concrete and metal poured from the rocks of the planet, all moving within the endless interchange from which our bodies are derived and from which others are already being born. Never does the process cease. Never does it fail us. It is endlessly consoling and reassuring and far more reliable than the concept of Judgment Day because we know it for a fact. <laughs>